Hi there everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm the GCSE science teacher and in today's video we're going to be learning about plant hormones for GCSE biology. If you do find this video helpful and you enjoy this sort of content, feel free to let me know by liking the video, sharing it with someone else and also do subscribe if you haven't already. And thank you so much for your support, I do appreciate it, so let's get started. First of all, a lot of us will understand this idea of hormones in a human biology context and we're going to build on that knowledge today because hormones are also released by plants and essentially a hormone is a chemical messenger that essentially gets the organism that it's released into to do something and respond to the environment and usually it's during a certain period of time such as puberty we may have heard of hormones um, increasing in prevalence in the body however hormones are released all the time every single day in our bodies um, to help us coordinate and just live the life that we do so in the case of the human physiology aspect of things how we know of it at the moment Remember, the endocrine system is this organ system that we understand as releasing hormones by glands. Now, glands are specific organs found in our body that have the ability to release those hormones. And those hormones get secreted directly into the bloodstream, which helps them to move to other target tissues or areas of the body which have receptors on that receive those hormones as they bind to them and then cause a response to occur. Now, some of those glands, like the pituitary gland, is what we consider a master gland because it has the ability to release a hormone that will then Act on another gland which will then release the hormone as well so that's why we call it a master gland and that is a key idea that you should know um, also they like you to compare the endocrine system to the nervous system as well so let's have a little bit of a recap remember the nervous system simply uh, coordinates the body through electrical impulses um, there are some other chemicals involved called neurotransmitters that occur at the synapse or those gaps between two neurons um, however the nervous system is considered much faster than the endocrine system for that very reason because it has those electrical impulses and the thing is with the nervous system it's quite a short lasting thing so once the electric the electrical impulse is fired that's how it goes it just gets passed on and then a response occurs it's very fast and automatic usually as well um, but with the endocrine system it's actually having a much longer lasting effect and it does take a longer time for this effect to occur as well because the hormones are traveling in the bloodstream which can take a bit of time as well so those are some key ideas to be aware of so a lot of the time when we think about hormones we understand it as a part of life that occurs when we're developing and growing from a child to an adult and this is the time we call puberty in humans and at this stage yes there is a definite increase in hormone levels but as I mentioned before hormones are constantly released all the time remember we talked about insulin and glucose regulation insulin is always being released um, in the human body when we consume food to store that glucose as glycogen so hormones are always being released to coordinate and control our bodies um, however this is very important to consider this idea of puberty because hormones do increase in their prevalence at that stage and the question therefore is if humans have hormones and plants have hormones and humans undergo puberty, do plants undergo puberty? And the answer is actually yes, plants do undergo their own version of puberty and this is called a vegetative state. Um, and this is essentially where the plant is starting to develop its leaves and those leaves we know are a really important organ in a plant because what they have is the ability to capture sunlight energy in the process of photosynthesis. How are the hormones different? How do they act? Because obviously the plants do not have blood like we do. So how are they traveling around? Well, they are still chemical messengers and we're going to discuss and learn about different types of hormones in plants today. Um, but they travel in the vascular tissues that we've learned about. So the xylem and the phloem. Remember the xylem uh, transports water in one direction from roots to leaves um, and the phloem transports glucose and other dissolved sugars in two directions. Um, and they both have the ability to transport those hormones as well. Um, what's actually very interesting about plants is they all have the ability, every single cell that makes up a plant has the ability to make and produce those hormones that do act on other parts of the plant. So this is usually due to the fact that each of those plant cells, the DNA inside, um, they have that genetic coding to do that. Um, also, interestingly enough, how does the information get passed on from cell to cell? Because of course the hormones are traveling around, but plants do have organs like we do, so they have um, you know, the, the leaves as an organ, they have the roots as an organ, um, but how do they get into the cells? Well, there's something called plasmodesmata, and this is a very interesting structure, not necessarily needed to know at GCC, but I thought I'd mention it here, that in between the cells of a plant, um, where the cell wall is, there are these little microscopic channels that those hormones can actually pass through and other communications can go on. So plants are very intelligent in that way. Um, and I just thought to share that with you guys. So in order to survive, plants require light and water for photosynthesis. And of course, they require CO2 as well. Um, and how do they get these things? Well, CO2 is in the atmosphere, so plants will absorb this um, through their stomata. But water and light are two slightly different components of the equation because plants actually have developed 
uh, responses, which we call tropisms, that actually help them grow towards uh, different sources of water and different sources of light as well. And we're going to talk about those different responses today and how plants actually do this. Um, remember, like I said, a tropism is just a response to a stimulus. So you can have a positive tropism or a negative tropism, meaning you can go towards the stimulus or away from it. And essentially, this helps those plants to grow just like our responses help us develop and grow as well. So there are two types of tropisms, two types of responses that you need to be aware of. We have geotropism, which is all to do with the soil and the earth, hence the word geo at the beginning, right? geology or geography, meaning the earth. Um, and that's where the water is found. And we also have phototropism, which means light. Remember, photo means light, uh, just like photosynthesis is to do with light, uh, creating something from light synthesis is creating. Um, so how does this happen? Well, if you look at the parts of a plant, if you look at the shoots and the roots of a very small plant in a seedling, you'll see that the shoots will always grow upwards and the roots will always grow downwards. And this doesn't matter which way you place the seed. If you turn it upside down and you put the roots at the top or the shoots at the bottom, them the roots and shoots will always try and reorientate themselves and this is because of this tropism response so the shoots for example want to grow upwards towards the light and this is what we call positive phototropism that light is the stimulus and the shoots are trying to get to the light because essentially that's where the leaves are going to grow negative geotropism in the shoots also occurs because we don't want the shoots to grow downwards towards the soil because that would be counterproductive now the opposite can be said for the roots so the roots the main job of that organ is to absorb water from the soil and those mineral ions um, by those specialized cells called root hair cells. And those root hair cells, as you know, do not have chloroplasts or chlorophyll. So there's no point those roots trying to grow upwards. And therefore, we have what we call negative phototropism and positive geotropism. So those roots will always grow downwards. Um, it's also worth mentioning at this stage the idea of stem cells in plants. We, as humans and other animals do as well, have stem cells. And these are cells that have not differentiated yet. They've not yet had the ability to become specialized cells. And essentially, plants have the same uh, types of cells. And these are called meri stems. And they're found specifically in the roots and shoots of growing plants. Um, and this is where a lot of the hormones are actually located, um, specifically a hormone we're going to talk about called auxin. And what, they, what this hormone does essentially is helps with growth and elongation of cells. So let's go and discuss that now. So let's talk about auxin. This is a hormone that is produced in the plant and its main job is to help with cell elongation and growth. Now, auxin is produced at the root and shoot tips of a plant. So we can actually investigate the effects of auxin in a few different ways. So what I have is three different pots of plants, A, B, and C. In A, we have the plant with the shoot tips cut off. In B, we have foil caps placed over the shoot tips. And in C, we have what we call a control. So nothing has happened to it. We just wanna see what the plant would do if we were to leave it to grow and kind of leave it to its own devices so over time we've given a bit of time we can see the results here so in a because the shoot tips were cut off that means there's no auxin anymore in the plant shoot tips and therefore the plant doesn't grow at all in b although there are foil caps over the top of the auxin the auxin has actually concentrated in equal amounts and equal equal distribution on the plant and therefore growth will occur but it won't uh, the plant will not have moved towards the uh, light stimulus. So the third one in C, the control, you can see that the plant is actually has moved towards the light source. So there is a positive phototropism here. Now, it's really important we say that the plant does not bend towards the light. I know it's very tempting because it looks like that's happened, but we actually want to use this word elongation because what's happened is on the shaded side of the plant where you can see um, on the left hand side of that plant where the shade would be. If you think about the sun on, on the on the right hand side, the left hand side of that plant will be the shaded part that side of the plant is, is actually elongated. So the cells have started to divide and grow on that side. And this is because auxin will actually um, be distributed more heavily in concentration on the shaded side. And therefore, if there's more auxin there, you will have more cell growth and therefore the cells will elongate. And that's why we have that curvature. Okay, so there is a required practical that you should know for this topic, and essentially it is to investigate the effect of light or gravity on the growth of newly germinated seeds. Um, the word germinated, by the way, just means that the seed has ended its dormancy period, so it started to sprout. And how do we do this? Well, the first thing you want to do is put cotton wool into three Petri dishes and add three drops of water to each of them. You then want to add some seeds to the dish, but you've got to be specific in the amount. So we're going to say 10 seeds here, and we're going to place them in a warm space. We then want to allow the seeds to germinate so they start to sprout and add more water if the cotton wool dries out. Once they have started to sprout, you want to place one Petri dish in the full light 
and one in a very dark cupboard and one in partial light. Now, it's important to say at this stage, some of the seeds may not actually germinate. So it's important to remove those out and only place the seeds that have germinated. Um, and if, say, there's only three in one and five in the other, you want to make sure there's the same number of germinated seeds in each Petri dish. So you have um, a control variable there. So after you've placed them in those different conditions, every day for one week, you want to measure the height of each seedling and you want to record the results in a table. Now, then what you need to do is you want to calculate the mean average of these recordings at the end and you want to compare the mean of the heights that you've uh, collected over that week um, to each other. So you'll have some readings for the uh, full light, the dark cupboard and partial light and you can compare those results now you're probably thinking okay it's quite straightforward if the plant does not get any light at all the plant's not really going to grow very much um, whereas in full light the plant will grow and that is the kind of thing you'd see um, so nice practical to show the effects um, of growth and light intensity there now in terms of this practical you need to know a couple of other things in terms of the variable so remember the control variable is something that you keep the same to compare your results that's why we do that and these control variables could include the number of seeds you use the species of the plant and the volume of water that you provide the plant. Um, the independent variable is something that you alter or something that you change in the experiment. So in this case, we're changing the light intensity and how much that plant receives the light. So usually the independent variable is something you're investigating, I for independent, I for investigation. And the dependent variable is what you are measuring. So we're actually measuring the length of those seedlings over a week's period and then calculating the mean average. So other than auxin, there are some other hormones in plants that you should be aware of. The first one is ethene. And ethene, as you may recognize, we've talked about it in chemistry before. It's a hydrocarbon. It's part of that homologous series called alkenes. So it has a carbon-carbon double bond. So what we know ethene as in that context, we can actually bring into this context as well. Um, ethene has a really important role, though, because it helps with ripening of fruit. And it also helps with controlling the cell growth, too. But one of the key things you should know is that ethene is actually sprayed onto plants um, um, especially fruits that have been harvested. Um, a lot of the time in agriculture, plants will have fruit that are not quite ripe yet, um, and we will pick them and we will transport them for storage to then go into supermarkets. At that storage stage, ethene is actually sprayed on those plants to help them develop and ripen. And this is because if we were to pick them when they're ripe and then transport them, they'd often go rotten before they reach the supermarkets. And obviously when we take them home, and actually, you can see the effects of ethene quite nicely in your own home if you wanted to. So if you have any bananas at home and you have other fruits that aren't quite ripened yet, some good examples are like avocados. If you haven't quite got those ripened yet, if you put them next to an avoc uh, a banana, the avocado next to a banana, it will actually start to ripen it. Um, and that's because bananas actually release that ethene um, naturally themselves. Um, another hormone that we haven't talked about yet is gibberellin. And this is a hormone that ends seed dormancy. So what do I mean by seed dormancy? If you buy a packet of seeds from the shop, for example, you'll see that they just stay in their dormant state. They don't do anything. They don't grow. They don't germinate. They don't sprout. And that's because they require a little bit of help to do that. They need some warmth. They need some water. Um, and that will help with the germination. But also this hormone gibberellin is released to help with ending that dormancy period and allow them to sprout and grow. Um, gibberellins also promote flowering in plants and they also promote increasing the fruit size as well so both gibberellin and ethene kind of work nicely together and then lastly we have talked about auxins in a cell elongation and cell growth way but actually auxin is used by farmers and agriculturalists um, in the case of killing weeds and um, also rooting powders so if you were to take a cutting of a plant and you snipped it and you placed the uh, plant into some auxin powder you could then place it into a, a pot of soil and it would actually start to develop its own root system and grow um, and this is often kind of like a nice way of actually cloning plants um, which leads me on to this idea of tissue culture which is a method that we use um, as scientists to basically clone plants over and over and over again um, and of course this has many pros and cons and I'll do a video on tissue culturing and plant cloning um, in the future so let me know in the comment section if that's something you'd like to see because it is definitely on my radar I do need to make that video for you guys but that's pretty much all you need to know about this. And that's it from me today. I've been the GCSE science teacher and you have been curious. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you found this video helpful. If you enjoyed it, please do like the video, share it with someone else and do subscribe as well. In the meantime, if you have any questions or queries or you would like to request any videos that I make next, please let me know in the comment section. And if you'd like some more revision support for GCSE science, I'll leave some videos linked here and uh, feel free to check out my Instagram and TikTok. Everything is at the GCSE science teacher. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time. Take care and I'll catch you in the next one.